as I said last week, I could literally talk about the Borgias all day. As I said last week, it's actually quite interesting that it took me four years of being on YouTube to finally cover the family that, in my opinion, is one of the most fascinating families in our human history. Now, last week, we started off with the patriarch of the Borgia family, Rodrigo Borgia. And that video will be down in the description box below if you missed it. No need to watch that video before this one, because honestly, every single member of the Borgia family is scandalous because of their enmeshment with each other. You can't tell one Borgia story without telling another Borgia story. But we're going to try to do that because, as I said last week, I'm trying to separate every member of the Borgia family to look at them on their own. And as I said last week, we are starting with, to me, the one Borgia that's probably the most innocent of them all. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a very, very special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without you guys, this channel would not be possible. If you would like to join our patron or our producer community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today we're going to be talking about Lucrezia Borgia. Now, again, in my opinion, Lucrezia Borgia is probably the most innocent out of all of the Borgia family members. Yes, they were very enmeshed with each other. Yes, they lived in a time that was very different from our own time. And therefore, their survival as noblemen and noble women probably meant that they had to do things that were not morally or ethically right. However, the path Lucrezia takes, if we can look at it from our own perspective in our modern eyes, is very much a path that Lucrezia herself was forced on. As many historians pointed out as I started to dig into the psychological effects of Lucrezia's story, Lucrezia is the one member of the family who really bears the scarlet letter. And as these historians pointed out, she bears that scarlet letter because, again, she was the only daughter of Rodrigo Borgia to survive into adulthood. And for many, many centuries, women have taken the brunt of all the scandals associated to a particular family. At the time of Lucrezia's life, when she was living out her days on this earth, there were whispers that the Borgias were involved in inappropriate relationships, especially with Lucrezia and her brother Cesare and Lucrezia and her father Rodrigo. There were rumors that there were inappropriate parties, if you know what I mean, being held at the Vatican and that the children of Borgia, Cesare Juan, Lucrezia, and Joffrey were all very much there at those parties. There was rumors that Lucrezia herself became the poison princess of the Pope. People believed that she had a ring that was either hollow and carried poison where she could just dump it into somebody's drink or had a needle where she could inject people with poison. By the time she was a teenager, she was already known as a femme fatale of the Vatican. It is said that Lucrezia Borgia was one of the inspirations for Cersei Lannister in the hit series Game of Thrones. And again, when we get to her brother Cesare and all the rumors around 
around their relationship, I think you will know why she was an inspiration for this particular character. Now, I've gotten some comments here and there about the way that I talk about these historical events or these people. And if you are somebody who is just interested in hearing the timeline and hearing the story of these people without any type of commentary, there are tons of channels out there where the content creator just literally tells you what happened. But that's not something that I am interested in. When I started this channel, it was my intention to take things that I like, like urban legends, paranormal phenomenon, spirituality, and of course, history, and look at these stories from a different perspective. To be able to not see the story as just a story, but to dive deep into these stories and pull them apart and look at these stories from all different perspectives. If I was not interested in hearing your opinion on these stories, I would never put this out on YouTube. As I said last week, especially regarding the Borgias, I really don't need to research a lot about the Borgias because I've been fascinated with this family since I was a teenager. So I definitely have my own opinions on this family, which I will express in this episode. But again, if I wasn't interested in your opinions, I would not put it on YouTube. I would just be happy with my own. But again, I open this channel so I can give my opinions and you in the comment section can give yours. Because I'm of the belief that in order to have an open mind and in order to grow as, as, as a collective, we need to be able to listen to every single person. Is every single person's perspective or opinion, including mine, going to be accurate? No. But digging through all of it, hopefully we can come to a better understanding of perhaps what really happened so that we can live our lives with more integrity and not repeat the mistakes of the past. And as a woman myself, looking at Lucrezia's story, I have so much empathy for the little girl who was placed in the den of thieves. Now, something interesting I want to point out too that another historian pointed out, and we kind of spoke a little bit about this last week. We know that in Europe at this time of the Borgias, which is the late 15th century, early 16th century, the Pope, as I believe the Pope still is today, was the top of the pyramid. He was the kingiest of kings. He controlled, like a chess game, all of the monarchs all over Europe. Now, the difference between the monarchy of the Pope of the Papacy and the monarchy of a country was the country was founded in a family bloodline. The Pope, the Papacy, was not. So, therefore, Within the Vatican, we can understand that there would have been more violence, more betrayal, more entrapment, and way more exploitation than there ever was in these other monarchs. It was literally a den of thieves, a dog-eat-dog -dog environment. And as we spoke about last week, at this time in history, it was advantageous for the cardinals and eventually the Pope, to have children, something we don't think about today. Of course, all of their children would have been considered illegitimate because, again, the Cardinals and the Pope were not allowed to marry because these children, if they were married to the mothers of these children, these children would be heirs to the Vatican power and the Vatican fortune. But with having children, illegitimate children, that were recognized as the children of these specific cardinals and of course eventually popes meant that these children were used as pawns to secure the cardinal or the pope with the consolidated power of the Vatican. Again, this was very, very, very commonplace. The fact that Rodrigo Borgia, Cardinal Borgia, who then became Pope Alexander VI had children was not weird. That was actually very, very normal. All of these children of these cardinals were recognized as they were treated like prince and princesses. They were married off to other noble families. 
and they were used more as pawns by the Pope than any of the children of the monarchy, especially the daughter. We know that kings and queens in, in Europe would use their princesses, the daughters, to create alliances with other countries. And we know that the daughters of kings, again, with that being said, were very much exploited. But the ante was upped with Lucrezia. You see, because the papacy was its own monarchy, and, but not a monarchy of bloodline, Lucrezia's value for Rodrigo, her stock was up more so than any princess of a king. Because you see, a king is always going to be able to pass down the throne to his son. The daughter of a king is just an extra little bit that they can use to seek alliances and powers with, whether, with other empires. But because Rodrigo Borgia cannot pass the papacy down to his sons, the alliances that he makes through Lucrezia are even more important for the House of Borgia. Now again, Cesare, Giovanni, who was called Juan, Joffrey, his sons, were also married off to very powerful families. However, their value, again, was not as high as Lucrezia's. Because at this point in history, as with most of our modern world history, a woman was not considered to be an autonomous being. So a woman could always marry up and therefore her family was handcuffed to a more powerful, more advantageous alliance. But with the sons, they're always going to be marrying lower, if that makes sense, because the daughter is coming into the Borgia family. And yes, the daughter's family is also handcuffed to the Borgias, but they're not going to rise in rank because it's the son. Whereas Lucrezia's marriage, because she's the daughter, is going to help the Borgias rise in their own rank. And Lucrezia being the only daughter of Rodrigo Borgia definitely carried the weight of that world on her shoulders. Now, with all the speculation around Lucrezia, because she is the one that has carried the scarlet letter of all the sins of her family, I'll, as I said, I have mentioned some of the scandals that revolve around her. But to do her some justice, in my opinion, some justice, we'll mention these scandals, but I want to go into great detail into these scandals when we get to her brother, Cesare, because Lucrezia and Cesare did have a very, very unique and very strong relationship. I don't know. At this point, I don't know if there was an inappropriate relationship going on or, as most historians agree today, the whispers of these scandals were whispers and propaganda created by their enemies. And as we know, we see this in our mainstream media all the time. We know that fake news is put out about other people in order to discredit them. So I do have a very open mind when it comes to Cesare and his sister Lucrezia. Honestly, I could be swayed either way. I also want to point out that a lot of people talk about how weird Rodrigo's relationship was with his four children. He was very, very invested in his four children, even more so than most cardinals and most popes. He does seem to be very emotionally also invested in his children, not just invested in them as political pawns. You know, when Juan was found, when his body was found in the river, it is said that Rodrigo Borgia went into mourning over the loss of his son. You know, you can't fake that emotion. So there is obviously a lot of love that a father, Rodrigo the father, does have for his kids. Now, this might seem weird to us, and it might have been like blown up in the past, because at this point in history, the parent-child relationship was not what it is today. In today's standard, it is considered weird or you're considered a deadbeat dad if you don't have a relationship with your children. But back in this time, parents, especially noble parents, they might have like loved their children, but their their relationship typically wasn't as bonded as Rodrigo was with his own kids. Now I have my own reasons to believe as as to why this probably happened. Um, but with that being said, if we were to take Rodrigo 
Cesare, Juan, Lucrezia, and Joffrey and put them in our timeline today, I don't think that we would see Rodrigo's relationship with his kids being any different than any of our own relationships with our own fathers. Now, because these four children were illegitimate, their mother, Vonaza, she was a Italian like bar owner, restaurant owner. Some people say she was a courtesan. She was married three times, but had this, she was obviously Cardinal Borgia's chief mistress as well, and had these four children with Rodrigo Borgia. Well, the reason why, another reason why I think Rodrigo took a very active role in these kids' lives is because of who their mother was. Even though the children loved their mother and Rodrigo and Bonazza obviously had a very close relationship, because their mother, there was some speculation about her be a, being a courtesan, Rodrigo needed to be more involved in the kids' lives and to bring them into the Vatican to, to be raised so that they would not carry the stigma of ill repute that their mother had. This was not just for their benefit, for their future, but also for the future of the Borgia dynasty so that he could arrange more advantageous marriages for his own kids. So there is there is logical reasons as to why some of these um, relationships were the way that they were. Now, the Borgia kids, Cesare Juan, Lucrezia, and Joffrey, all were very close as well. And according to many historians, children of nobility, even though they did not have close relationships maybe with their parents, which was very different from the Borgias, it was very common for siblings to be extremely close. In this time in history, not just in the Vatican, but in a lot of courts across Europe, the children, the siblings, the full-blooded siblings, were truly the only people that really had each other's backs. There was so much betrayal going on in these courts, in the papacy, people were, you know, stabbing people in the back. There was so much going on that a full-blooded sibling is going to always be more loyal to the other full-blooded sibling than to anybody else. Regardless of whether this these are the ancestors of our controllers, regardless of whether we think they were psychopaths or not, not all of them were. And to have that fear, to have that instability, and to know that you have a brother or a sister that you can cling to seems very, very natural. Now, Juan and Cesare, which we'll talk more about Juan and Cesare's relationship when we get to them, they, they were always kind of in competition with each other. But definitely Lucrezia and Cesare had a, he was very protective of Lucrezia. Again, was it inappropriate? Did they cross lines? I don't know. I could see it being either way. I could see it being propaganda or being true. A lot of historians today don't, they think it was propaganda and that he was literally just a very protective older brother. But with that being said, there is still a big question mark over that. Now, Lucrezia Borgia was not just the inspiration for Cersei Lannister. She There's also operas about her. There's many books that were written about her. There's so many movies with all different languages about her her specifically. And I think, again, a lot of that has to do with she was the only daughter of Rodrigo Borgia. Now, it is true that Rodrigo Borgia had other illegitimate children with other mistresses. And so a lot of people have pondered, why was it that his focus was on these four, these four children with Boneza? It wasn't just the fact that she was his chief mistress and they, the four of these kids were full-blooded siblings I, I, people have speculated that maybe there is more to that story and guess what there is more to that story because i obviously did a little digging into the other illegitimate children of rodrigo borgia because even in a lot of the um like the showtime series on the borgias they don't 
talk about these other children. It's just the focus is on the four um, that are the famous four children. And the reason why we don't hear about the other illegitimate children of Rodrigo Borgia, from what I could tell, looking through the records, finding their names, the other children didn't live past childhood. The other children died as, as kids, which happened a lot back then. And I think it's safe to say that if the other illegitimate children had lived into adulthood, they probably would have been just as loved and just as used and just as exploited as the four Bo Borgia children that did live into adulthood. Now, with that being said, the four Borgia children living into adult, they lived long enough to get married, to have children of their own, to cause quite a ruckus in Europe, to have this salacious propaganda around them, but they all died relatively as young adults. And in fact, Lucrezia Borgia was the one child who lived the longest. And she was the one child, in my opinion, that had a very noble passing. She passed away at 39 years old in childbirth. The rest of them passed away, were unalived in very scandalous ways. Um, their unaliving had a lot to do with the reputation that they carried around Europe. So with that being said, let's get into Lucrezia Borgia. Lucrezia Borgia was born the third child of Rodrigo Borgia and Bonesa, his chief mistress, on the 18th of April, 1480, in a little area outside of Rome, like the suburbs of the Papal States. Lucrezia, again, was the third child of this couple, and she was the only daughter of this couple. She had her older brother, Cesare Juan, and then later a little brother, Joffrey. Lucrezia was given an education unlike any other noble girl of her time. Most girls of noble blood at this time were educated at the local convent, but Lucrezia was given a private education in an adjoining par apartment in the Vatican by a woman named Adriana Orsini. Now, this is really interesting to me. If you know anything about history or about the power brokers of our world, the Or Orsinis are a huge, huge name. And many people speculate that the Orsini family is still a bloodline family in control of our world today. There's also speculation that the Borgias are still a bloodline family of our world today, which we will talk about at some point. But I, I just think this is interesting that not only was Lucrezia not given the typical education of a noble girl, she was given a private education by one of the most powerful families in Europe. She learned from Adriana Orsini how to speak multiple languages. Like this chick could literally speak every language in Europe at the time. It is said that the family, when they were by themselves, spoke Catalan, which is a specific language to their Spanish heritage, even though Lucrezia and her brothers were half Spanish, half Italian, since their mother was full-blooded Italian, Catalan was their, their native language at home. But they also became fluent in the traditional speaking of Spanish, Italian, French, Latin, and Greek. Now, when Lucrezia was born in 1480, her father, Rodrigo, was already 49 years old. So quite an elderly person at this time, even though 49 is not old now. But he was already up there in age and had established himself pretty powerfully within the Vatican as a, as a cardinal. By her birth, he was 12 years away from becoming pope. But we can definitely see that even by 1480, this was kind of Rodrigo's goal. His vision board, if you will, was to become, eventually become the Pope. And so since Lucrezia, being the only daughter of Rodrigo Borgia, was the most valuable as far as her marriage arrangements as an adult, we can understand why Rodrigo would want to give her a very special education. Because not only is she the daughter of hopefully one day going to be the daughter of the Pope if he has it his way, but she's also got this high level of education where she is able to carry herself in court, in diplomatic meetings. She's able to speak multiple languages. She is looking very good 
very good for any monarchy around the world to have as a married part of their family. Now, Rodrigo, even though Lucrezia herself was a woman, he really trusted her academically. In fact, one of the big scandals with Lucrezia, which I think is hysterical, because in today's age, this would not be a scandal at all. There were times when, when Rodrigo did become the Pope, where he could not attend certain meetings with certain officials. And so he would send Lucrezia in his absence. And Lucrezia would sit on the throne of St. Peter to speak to these diplomats from all these countries. And the scandal of having a woman sitting on the throne of St. Peter's was a bigger scandal than any of the salacious scandals of her intimate life, possibly with her siblings and her father, or the fact that she carried poison on her body. Just the fact that she was sitting on St. Peter's throne as a woman. I mean, I chuckle at this because in this light, even though we know the Borgias were not the best people in the world, especially Rodrigo Borgia, I kind of like this about him, though, that he literally saw his daughter, even though the culture did not see her as being equal in value to her brothers or to any man. He saw her as valuable. He saw her as smart. He trusted her to to do to carry out these meetings in his absence so obviously with that being said lucrezia was obviously a very intelligent young lady and, and very well spoken and her education really did put her in a very powerful position as a woman now on top of that lucrezia borgia and this is very important i know in today's society we don't want to think about looks as having value to a person, but let's be real for a moment. In the secular world, they can at times be important, especially in Renaissance Italy. And Lucrezia Borgia, all the Borgia children were very good looking, especially Cesare, like as much of a bad boy as Cesare was, the dude was hot. You know, there's no denying it. These were very good looking kids. Rodrigo Borgia, not so much, but but Voneza, his chief mistress, she was known for her beauty. And so we see that these four kids carry a lot of their mother's good looks. Now, the boys were of darker complexion like their father, but Lucrezia, she was almost identical to her mother. And for the ideal picture of beauty during the Renaissance, Lucrezia hit all the marks. She had very thick, long, blonde, reddish blonde hair. She was very pale skinned. She, it is said she had hazel eyes that changed colors. There's a lot that is written about her bosom, which to me that word signifies an older woman. But nonetheless, what I think the, the people of that time were, were saying when they were talking about her was her body, that she had the perfect hourglass figure that was considered to be of the utmost beauty at this time. Of course, nowadays, our standards of beauty, especially for women, are more physical fitness. But back then, they liked more of a plumper woman. And it is said that she had all of these features. So again, this is so advantageous for Rodrigo Borgia. He's got this daughter who has now an incredible education. And she's also the standard of beauty for this time in Europe. She is like his biggest pawn. Now, before Rodrigo Borgia became the Pope, when he was just Cardinal Borgia, even when Lucrezia was a small child, he had arranged a few engagements for Lucrezia that were called off. And this this happened all the time. This is not super scandalous. We see this within the monarchs. Well, they'll promise their kids to another ruler's kids when they're really young and then over time alliances change and engagements are called off so that's i don't even want to talk about those engagements because those are just that that was pretty standard for that time but as soon as rodrigo borgia became the pope in 1492 this is when he really started to play with lucrezia because again as pope alexander the sixth Rodrigo Borgia was the most powerful man of all the land. And so his daughter, 
I mean, she was, she was ripe for the exploitation and for the bribery. And I do think that two things can be true, as I say a lot. I think that Alexander the Sixth, Pope Alexander the Sixth, Rodrigo Borgia could really love his daughter the way a father is supposed to love his daughter, but also be exploiting her at the same time. And no one would have batted an eye at this because this was pretty standard for the culture of nobility during this time in Europe. Lucrezia's first marriage was to a man named Giovanni Sforza. His uncle, Giovanni's uncle, was a cardinal who arranged this match with Pope Alexander VI. Now, the House of Sforza was the ruling house of Milan at this time. And again, if you remember from our last two episodes, Italy itself was not a unified country. It was like these little principalities that were constantly fighting each other. So we see these areas like Milan, Naples, Florence, Venice. These are all their own little kingdoms. And so again, the Swartzes were the ruling house of Milan. They themselves had a family member who was a cardinal who was arranging a marriage between Giovanni Swartza to Lucrezia. Now, Giovanni Sforza had been married before. His wife had passed away. He himself was born in 1466. So he was a good bit older than Lucrezia. In fact, he was 14 years older than Lucrezia to be exact. And at a certain point, I don't think a 14 year age gap, gap makes that big of a difference. But at this point, it makes a huge difference because Lucrezia herself is only 12 years old. Now, they arranged this marriage, but because of Lucrezia's age, the first marriage was done by proxy. And Lucrezia had to stay at the Vatican for a full year before she was able to, quote unquote, consummate her marriage with Giovanni. They say it's because of her age again. My understanding is it probably meant, and this is just my speculation, that when she was married to Giovanni by proxy, she probably did not have her period. That's what I think that means. And I know for a great deal of our history, as weird as it is to think about today, a woman was considered to be marriageable when she had her cycle. And we know that girls get their periods anywhere between 10 and 14 years old. 12 is a very typical age for girls. That's when I got mine. That's when most of my friends got theirs. So obviously Lucrezia probably did, again, this is my speculation, probably didn't get her period until she was like 13. And by the time she got her cycle, that's when she was able to then consummate her marriage with Giovanni. Now, again, Giovanni was a lot older than her and as I said, if you're 30 and your husband's 44, that's not a big deal. But if you're 12, 13 and your husband's 26, 27, that's a huge deal. And that's a crime in our modern world. Now, in the Showtime series of the Borgias, where Jeffrey Irons plays Rodrigo Borgia, it's brilliant. The casting of the Borgia Showtime series is brilliant the way they casted it. We'll talk more about that when we get to Cesare, because the guy who plays Cesare Borgia in the Showtime series, not only is he hot, but he looks just like Cesare Borgia. But anyway, um, just a little observation as a girl. You know, I'm still a girl. I can still look, you know, at all these cute boys. But um, there is the scene, the scene in, in um, this Showtime series where they're married officially when they come to he comes to the Vatican and they throw this lavish party and I noticed something too and this is in the notes as well at these parties these wedding parties the Bor Borgias would often dress up in like animalistic costumes that is very similar and reminds me of all those crazy parties that the Rothschilds hold where they dress in animal costumes Anyway, just an observation. But in the scene in the Showtime series of Lucrezia marrying this much older man, and the actor who plays Giovanni Sforza is obviously a lot older than 26, but I think they did that to show an image of the distinct age difference between these two people. When it comes to their reception, it, it's, it's quite a touching scene. All the adults are partying and drinking and eating, and the character of Lucrezia she's asleep on the table like a child would be 
that was forced to stay up late at an adult party. It shows Cesare coming and picking her up and taking her to bed that night and tucking her in like a child, even though it's her wedding night. And I just thought that Showtime and the directors of the of the Borgia series, miniseries, obviously, whenever you're doing a miniseries over a historical family, there's going to be poetic license taken. But I just thought they did such a brilliant job depicting how much of an age difference there was between Giovanni Sforza and Lucrezia. Lucrezia was a child, a little girl. Even though she probably had her period at this time, she was nowhere near ready for the responsibilities of being a wife. She was nowhere near ready for the responsibilities of the intimacy that is required of a wife. And in fact, in multiple places in this series, Rodrigo Borgia talks about how Lucrezia was still playing with dolls when she married Giovanni Schwarza. That is just something that we would not stand for in our modern society. We would see that as Lucrezia being a victim of abuse. But in this world, this was normal. It is said that as was customary at this time, and this is really important foreshadowing what's to come with Giovanni Schwarza, that Pope Alexander VI, Rodrigo Borgia, Lucrezia's father, was in the bedroom the night of their consummation. Now, again, we see this as totally disgusting in our own modern world. But back then, there always had to be a witness that the marriage contract was fulfilled. Usually, it was a man of the church. It just so happened in this situation that the man of the church was also the bride's father. Lucrezia was then taken up to Milan, where she lived for two years. It is said that Lucrezia had a really hard time in these two years. Again, she was still extremely young. Milan was very, very different from what she had known at the Vatican, where she had lived her whole entire life. She was separated now from her siblings, from her father. And again, I can only imagine the stress of a, of a 13-year-old girl having to now be a wife. It is also said that Giovanni Schwarza was not the nicest of human beings. I think at this point, we would definitely say that this was not a good relationship. There was a lot of DV probably in this relationship. I, I'm not going to domestic. You feel that I have to be careful with YouTube with these words, but um, definitely was not a good situation for Lucrezia. In 1495, Lucrezia and Giovanni return to the Vatican for the Christmas holiday season. At this point, there was a lot of favor that the Sforzas in Milan was losing with Pope Alexander VI. This alliance was not necessarily working to Rodrigo's advantage. And so what to do? What are we going to do now that Lucrezia is married to this man and we don't need this family anymore? We actually need Lucrezia to be married to someone else for a stronger alliance. The Schwartzes have to go. He needs his daughter to now marry another family, his only daughter. She's it. She's the one. She's the one that's got to do this. And so we have a problem because in the Catholic faith, divorce is not an option. And we have it on record that Pope Alexander VI, Rodrigo Borgia himself, did witness the consummation of Giovanni and Lucrezia. So how are we going to get Lucrezia out of this marriage honorably? The Borgias, doing what the Borgias do best, order a hit on Giovanni. That'll take care of it. We'll just order a hit on him. Now, Lucrezia, and this, this speaks of, of her innocence and her purity, which a lot of people at times spoke about her kindness. Lucrezia was not like her family members in this way. Even though she had had a very rough relationship with Giovanni, she learns about this hit. Her Cesare probably told her, you know, their siblings. He probably say, hey, we're going to get you out of this marriage. And she panics and she runs and tells Giovanni 
what her family is planning to do to him. And so Giovanni flees Rome. Once Giovanni has fled Rome, we have a problem because we can't put a hit on him. We can't unalive him. So what are we going to do? Well, Rodrigo decides that he's going to rewrite history at this point. What he's going to do since Lucrezia and Giovanni Sforza have no children, what he's going to do is he is going to file for them to have an annulment. Now, he's the Pope. He can do this if he wants. He can annul people if he wants. But he has to get the Schwartz family and Giovanni specifically to agree to this annulment. He's going to annul the marriage on the grounds that it's never been consummated. But we have it in written record that Rodrigo Borgia himself witnessed the consummation. So again, he, he's going to rewrite history. and He needs the Schwartzes to agree to rewrite this history, that their marriage was never consummated. And on top of that, he wants Giovanni himself to admit on record that their marriage wasn't consummated because he is impotent. Well, he's not impotent because Giovanni Schwartza, like most men in this era, had illegitimate children with his mistress. So he's not impotent. But nonetheless, after all this squawking, after everything, there was threats thrown. Like Gio uh, the Borgias were like, listen, House of Schwartz, Giovanni, do you know who I am? I'm the kingiest of kings. I'm the Pope. I'm king of the world. I'm the top of the pyramid. If you don't agree to these conditions to annul your marriage to my daughter, we will withdraw everything from you. You will be hunted and your life will be made a living hell. And so Giovanni Schwartz basically says, okay, I will agree to this annulment. I will say I'm, I'm impotent and that our marriage was never consummated. But Giovanni Schwartz isn't going to go down without a fight. At this point, Giovanni Schwartz is the first person to start the rumors that Lucrezia has an inappropriate relationship with her brother, Cesare, and with her father, Rodrigo. This is the first time we're seeing these rumors being spread by Giovanni Sforza himself. Is it propaganda? Is it not? I guess the world will never really know. But we do know at this point, while this annulment is happening, while all these negotiations are happening or threats are happening between the Vatican and the House of Schwarza, Lucrezia herself is taken to a convent to ride out this period of time. This is the convent of San Sisto. And nobody really knows the true story about what happened when she was in this convent. All we know is that all of a sudden, there's another baby in the Borgia family. This baby became known to historians as the Infus Romanus, or the Roman infant. There are many people who believe that this child was the child of Lucrezia and a stage hand named Pedro. A boy that worked for the Schwartz family that was around her age that perhaps she had a romantic relationship with while she was married to Giovanni Schwartz. You can't blame the girl, right? Like she's a teenager. And she got pregnant. And a lot of people believe that she was sent to this convent not just to keep her in hiding because she's young as they're going through these negotiations to get her out of the public eye so she can not be subject to everything going on, but because she was actually pregnant and giving birth to a baby. And the people could speculate that that baby was perhaps the child of Giovanni Schwarza, basically nullifying the annulment. Now, interestingly enough, this little boy, this baby boy was given the name Giovanni himself. And this mysterious new Borgia baby, Borgia infant, obviously was a lot of fodder for gossip in the Vatican. So in 1501, Pope Alexander VI, Rodrigo Borgia, issues two papal bulls regarding this specific baby. And these papal bulls are very confusing because they were released on the same day 
and they basically give conflicting messages over who is the father of this child. In one of the papal bulls, it is stated that Cesare Borgia is the father of this child. In another papal bull released on the same day, it is stated that Alexander VI, Pope Alexander VI, Rodrigo Borgia himself, is the father of this child. So we have all these speculations now. First of all, is this child Giovanni Schwartz's child? Is it Pedro's child? Is it Cesare Borgia's child? Is it Rodrigo's child? And regardless, who's the mother? Is it Lucrezia? Is this is Lucrezia, is this child the product of a legit marriage? Or is it the product of an affair that Lucrezia had with a stagehand? Or is this a, the child a product of incest? No one really knows. But this Pedro, the, the dude she was accused of having an affair with, the young kid that was close to her age, did end up in the river, if you know what I mean. Like, literally, that's where his body was found, but he went to swim with the fishes. And another maid that worked with him also ended up in the river. So people speculate that it probably was the baby of Pedro and Lucrezia, and this other maid knew, and so they got rid of the two maids, or the stagehand and the maid, they got rid of the help, basically, to keep this secret between the Borgias that this baby was actually Lucrezia's, because even if it wasn't Giovanni Schwartz's baby, we still want Lucrezia to have the image of being pure. You know, the whole annulment was based on the fact that Giovanni Schwartz was impotent, and she was still a virgin. So we can't let anybody know that regardless of who the father is, that the baby came from Lucrezia. And Lucrezia herself introduced this baby as her half-brother. Her second marriage was to a man named Alfonso of Aragon. And if you remember Aragon, the area of Spain where the Borgias come from, was in charge of the kingdom of Naples, where the papal states existed. And so by marrying Lucrezia to Alfonso of Aragon, who was son of the guy who controlled Naples, then it would give the Borgias a stronger hold on Naples itself. Now, Alfonso of Aragon, unlike Giovanni Sforza, was age appropriate for Lucrezia. He was actually a year younger than Lucrezia. They were only separated in age by mere months. And it is stated that like Lucrezia, Alfonso of Aragon was seen as the most beautiful boy in all of Rome. He himself was very tall. He had very fair complexions. And it is stated that Lucrezia fell head over hills in love with her second husband. Now, was it really love? Was it a childhood crush? Now, again, let's rem remember, my friends, by this time, Lucrezia is 18 and Alfonso himself is only 17. These are young kids. And so I can assume that Lucrezia was, first of all, just so freaking excited to have a man that's like her age that she can marry. He's also extremely good looking, which we cannot say the same thing about Giovanni Sforza. I can imagine that Lucrezia marrying Alfonso and Alfonso for Lucrezia too. Here's a young guy. He's a young guy. He's got this beautiful woman, a teenage girl, his age, they're, they're age appropriate, right? That he's now going to marry. I'm sure that they were both just head over heels in love with this idea of being able to call consummate this marriage where they're both learning and exploring things at the same time one was not more advanced than the other they were they were going to be experiencing life at the same pace and so we could say that if, if if this had been it for Lucrezia, her life would have ended in a happily ever after. But unfortunately, we know that's not what happens, not for any of the Borgias, with that being said. So Lucrezia does marry Alfonso of Aragon. Now, Alfonso is also related to a woman named Sancha of Aragon. She's his sister. And Sancha is going to come back into play. She interweaves herself throughout all of the Borgias. So not only is Sancha now Lucrezia's sister-in-law, but Sancha is married off to Joffrey, 
Lucrezia's younger brother. But Sancha, like Lucrezia and like Sancha's brother Alfonso, is also considered to be one of the beauties of the Italian Renaissance. And so Sancha becomes the mistress to both Cesare and Juan, her brother-in-laws, Joffrey's brothers, Lucrezia's brothers. So this just shows how enmeshed all of these noble families are. So Alfonso and Lucrezia are the newlyweds. Sancha is going to be marrying Joffrey. Sancha is also the daughter of the King of Naples. So the Borgias are like locked into Naples at this point. Sancha's boinking all the boys in the Borgia family. I'm sure, I don't mean to say it that way. I'm sure she really didn't have a choice. I don't think women had much choice at that point. So they are totally enmeshed together. And we definitely know that Lucrezia and Alfonso consummated their marriage and were excited to consummate their marriage in 1499. Now, again, this is before the papal bull was put out about the other baby. But in 1499, Lucrezia does get pregnant with Alfonso's baby. Unfortunately, she does miscarry that baby, but it's not long after that she falls pregnant again with Alfonso's child. So this is now even, you know, when you marry people to create an alliance, it's super important to then have children because that strengthens the alliance of the two families. So now that she is pregnant with a baby of the Napoleon, of, of the Napoleon dynasty of Aragon that's ruling Naples and she's the, the, I mean, this is just like, this should be a contract made in cabal heaven because now they are literally locked into this land these ruling families because she's about to give birth to a child that is both the, has both the families in them but at this time pope alexander the sixth is starting to look towards france king louis the twelfth of france also lays claims to naples King Louis the Twelfth of France is married to a woman that is not super advantageous for him, and he he wants to claim Brittany. Brittany, the northern part of France, was not a part of France at this time, and he wants to annex Brittany onto France. And so he's trying to negotiate with Pope Alexander the Sixth in order to have more power himself to get this annulment. And so Alexander the Sixth starts realizing that he has other options besides the family he's married, Lucrezia and Joffrey into in Naples. With that being said, again, Joffrey's married into this family as well with Sancha, but because Joffrey is the man, he's not as mobile as Lucrezia, the daughter, I, as I spoke about at the beginning of this video. And so Sancha and Joffrey's relationship is not going to be touched. The person that we need to now get out of this negotiation, the person that we now need to get out of this alliance with Naples is Lucrezia. Once again, we need to get Lucrezia, or not we, Pope Alexander VI, Rodrigo Borgia, needs to get Lucrezia out of this marriage with Alfonso so she can be mobilized to a stronger ally for the House of Borgia. But again, we have a problem. We don't have the same problem that we had with Giovanni Schwarza because Lucrezia is pregnant. They've consummated this marriage. There's no way out of this marriage for Lucrezia unless Alfonso passes away. She has consummated this marriage. And, and what's so sad and what gets me is Lucrezia was happy. She loved Alfonso of Aragon. Alfonso of Aragon was truly the love of her life. But she's the daughter. She's not just the daughter. She's the daughter of the Pope. She's the only daughter, the only living daughter of the Pope. Again, her stock is high. And because she's the only living daughter of the Pope, her life is not her own. She is not autonomous to her own choices. With this agreement, with Louis XII of France, Cesare Borgia is arranged to marry Charlotte of Albret. Charlotte of Albret is the daughter of King John III of Navarre. We've, we've spoken about Navarre in the past with Catherine de Medici and 
Henry the Fourth. Um, Navarre is a part of France, and they're they're totally tied to the sitting monarchy in 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 France. And so now Cesare is marrying into the French dynasty. At that point, because of that marriage, Lucrezia is starting to realize that her marriage to Alfonso of Aragon is in trouble. At the same time, the Pope gives dip dispensation to the French army to invade Naples. Now again, the, the Vatican is in Naples. And so Lucrezia and Alfonso actually lived at the Vatican with Lucrezia's family. At the point of the invasion, with the blessing of Lucrezia, Alfonso flees Rome. And I can only imagine the stress that Lucrezia was under. At this point, Lucrezia was six months pregnant with Alfonso's child. She is still a young girl at this time. She truly loves her husband. She she also loves her family. Her family has now in, in invited the enemies of her husband's family in to invade her husband's land. She knows what her family is capable of. She knows they're capable of unaliving people. She's not going to put it past her her family to do that to her husband. And so she, with her blessing, she encourages Alfonso to get out of Rome just to keep him alive. Alfonso eventually comes back because obviously Lucrezia is about to give birth to his child. Lucrezia begs her father, begs her brothers to leave Alfonso alone. Please just let us live in peace. Alfonso comes back to the Vatican. Lucrezia gives birth to a little boy that she actually names after her father. She names her son with Alfonso Rodrigo. Rodrigo is born on either the 31st of October 1499 or the 1st of November 1499. Anyway, a few months later, and in July of 1500, Alfonso is walking down the stairs at St. Peter's Basilica. I've been there. I'm sure many of you have been there. And a group of what appears to be beggars, friars, poverty-stricken, kind of like St. Francis of Assisi, as we spoke about on Monday, start to walk up the stairs passing Alfonso. So Alfonso obviously thinks nothing of this group, of what he perceives to be poor friars coming to serve and worship in mass. As they're passing Alfonso, they attack Alfonso with knives. The scene that is described is one of a bloodbath, but at some point, Alfonso's own bodyguards see what's happening. They get Alfonso and they bring him into the Borgia Towers, the apartments that belong to the Borgias at the Vatican. And for a long time, Sancha, his sister, and Lucrezia's sister-in-law, and Lucrezia nurse Al Alfonso back to health. It is said that at one point, Lucrezia took over doing all of his meal prepping and cooking for him because she wanted to make sure that he wasn't being poisoned. And it does say that Alfonso was getting better and probably would have survived, except one night, an assassin gets into his room and strangles him. Many people assume it actually was Cesare who did the strangling. I don't know. But we do know the hit was most likely put on Alfonso by the Borgias in order to free up Lucrezia to be used again and exploited again for their own power and their own greed. After Alfonso's passing, Lucrezia went into a deep depression. She was incredibly heartbroken. And I think most of us guys or girls, you can relate to that feeling. Um, you know, even not just that your, your loved one died, but I, I can almost imagine too, it's like this idea of unrequited love as well, because she truly loved Alfonso and the fact that their relationship was cut so short, they didn't have a chance to really grow old together or to experience life together. It's not just the fact that he passed away, it's the fact that it's unrequited, right? She, she This is the love of her life. This is the, the man that she was super passionate about and all that was taken away from her. And not only was that taken away from her, but it was taken away from her by the people who are supposed to love her the most, her family. It is said that Lucrezia was so heartbroken 
that her family moved her into an apartment on the other side of the Vatican so they didn't have to deal with her. Now, even though I'm sure Lucrezia suspected that her brother was maybe the one who did it, what's interesting, and, and I would love to hear a, psych a psychologist's perspective on this, is that even though she knew this, she still stayed loyal to her family. And she still stayed loyal to her brother. And I don't know if this is some weird version of Stockholm Syndrome or her own survival or this weird dichotomy and complexity of maybe not liking somebody because of what they did to you, but nonetheless still loving them. I mean, I think we all have those people in our, in our lives that we don't like them because of actions they've taken, but we still love them. We still want the best for them. And, and again, even though I would love to hear a psychiatrist's perspective of Lucrezia at this time, I think there is some understanding that all of us, even though none of us watching, hopefully none of us watching come from any of these crazy controller families, as human beings, I think we can still kind of understand, again, the complexities of, of Lucrezia's emotions at this time. She's also a young mother. Let's not forget that. She's in postpartum. She's just had a baby. And it is said that she idolized her son, as any mother should idolize their child. She loved her baby. This was her baby with her husband, the, the man that she truly loved that was taken from her. And, and I can imagine that her naming her son after her father was in some respect a way to perhaps maybe get her father not to do the inevitable. And that was remove her husband from her. Around this time, because of Lucrezia's deep mourning, because of the very obvious situation to everybody else in, in Rome, that's when the rumors of her becoming a poison princess started, where people started talking about the ring that she carried, the cunning way that she would help assassinate people in Rome by dropping poison into their drinks. You know, unaliving people is never a, a good thing um, unless it's self-defense. But if this is true, if this rumor about Lucrezia Borgia is true, that she was the poison princess, Part of me kind of understands. I, I mean, she is literally, her life is not her life. She has no autonomy over her choices. I've said so many times again that if I lived at this time, I would so much rather be a peasant because at least as a peasant, you have some control. Even a female peasant who still isn't considered a human being has more autonomy and more self governess over themselves than these noble women had. These noble women were just as enslaved as the help, maybe more so, because their lives, their bodies, their sexuality was fodder for their families reach for power. So if Lucrezia became a poison princess after the hell she had been through, I kind of don't blame her. I kind of don't blame her. And if she felt like she could take some control over her own life by getting rid of men that scared her or perhaps threatened her, Remember, she doesn't have the right as a woman to take control of anything. She doesn't have the right to point out, I'm trying to watch my words, guys, to be like, this guy violated me. She doesn't have that right because her being violated isn't, a, isn't about her. It isn't about her governess and her autonomy and her right to choose. It's not about her family wanting her to be happy in her intimate relationships. Her sexuality is a tool. And if she's violated, it's not about her feelings. It's about the fact that they need to keep her pure and no one needs to know about her violation 
because we got to sell her now to the highest bidder. And if she's, and if, if she seemed to be, if it seems that she's been deflowered in some way, I'm trying to watch my words, guys. If she's trying, if she seemed to have been deflowered in some way, then she's not going to be as valuable to these families that the Pope wants to make an alliance with or that her brothers want to use her to make an alliance with. So again, if Lucrezia was doing this, after all of this had happened, then as a woman, woman to woman, what a fucking badass. Now, with that being said, we have no actual proof. There is no proof that she was literally doing this. Um, we do know that there were specific parties around this time that were also being held at the Vatican where particular group intimacy was happening the, ba the bouquet of chestnuts is one in particular, which we're going to talk more about with Cesare. I kind of want to leave that for Cesare's story because I want to do a little bit more justice with um, Lucrezia here just because she was kind of the innocent, in my opinion, the innocent victim in all this. And even if she was there at these particular parties, participating in these parties with her brother and her father and all the other people that were doing it, I, I would think Lucrezia out of anybody and probably the other women there probably didn't have a choice. And so since she has historically carried the Scarlet Letter with these, these particular salacious scandals, I'm going to save the salacious scandals again when, when it comes to the banquet of chestnuts. We're going to save that for Cesare's story. We're going to put it on him and not her on this channel because I think, I think, and maybe that's because I'm a woman and I, and I see things a little bit differently and I, I would love to hear your perspective again. That's what this channel is for. As I said in the beginning for us to talk about this and our perceptions, but just knowing as a woman today in 2024 and the, the sexual harassment and, and the, the stuff that's happened to me, when I am an autonomous human and I do have the right to go to the police and I do have, you know, the right to be my own person. I know what it's like for me. I can't imagine. I cannot imagine what it was like 500 years ago for a women in these noble cir no circles of nobility. I think we need to give them a little bit of a break. I, I really do think the women need to, to be given a little bit. We, we need some some forgiveness, some, some room for forgiveness with the women because I think in a lot of ways, especially looking at Lucrezia's story, they were just trying to survive. So now we have a challenge to find this third husband for Lucrezia. All these salacious rumors are out there. Her two other husbands have not worked out. Um, people are scared of the Borgias, but again, they need the Borgias because they are sitting on the throne of St. Peter's. So we are now looking for a third husband for Lucrezia, the now labeled femme fatale of the Vatican. But before we get into her final marriage and what happened at the end of her life, we're going to take a brief moment to hear a word from our sponsor, Spooky2. I am so excited to be sponsored by Spooky2. When it comes to taking your power back from the powers that be in the world, we know that our physical health is of the utmost importance. And Spooky2 Rife Machine is just one way in which you can start to take back your own autonomy and your own health choices. Spooky 2 works with the vibrational energy of the body and has so many different options of things you can do to help with all sorts of dise diseases, dis diseases, there we go, long-term sicknesses and energetic imbalances. So here is a word from Spooky 2. If you would like to purchase a Spooky 2 Rife machine for yourself, if you enter discount code Bryce Watson, my name, B-R-I-C-E-W-A-T-S-O-N at checkout, you will get 5% off of your purchase. All that information is down in the description box below. Hi, Joan, Echo, and the Spooky Do team. This is Kanika here, and I'm here to share not just my and my partner's Spooky Do journey. Spooky Do has been superbly special for my partner and I. I'm actually sitting in the scalar field. In our personal experiences, my partner and I have uh, literally gone off all our, our vitamin and multivitamin multivitamin and mineral supplements we hardly take them we used to take them to support and supplement our well-being 
but I've been using the daily wellness protocol and my hair has just exploded in its growth. The skin's gotten uh, beautiful. The DH experimental frequencies, I've been experimenting with a lot of them. We have such good strength in our body. We don't fall ill to an extent that my partner has hay fever. Peter, he has hay fever, but this time, I've started using the immune super booster and oh my god it is magic uh, we recently this year purchased the remotes as well so we use our DNA clipping and we put our clippings in it and uh, it's just been so beautiful and profound and I have always been so I pray daily I meditate daily and I've been sitting in the scale of field and meditating and praying and my psychic abilities, my connection to the divine, if I just want to put it in a nutshell, is just increasingly becoming so potent. I've been using the 12 strand DNA activation as well and the DH experimental frequencies just to see how it goes. And the, the effects are so magnificent in our, on our physical bodies and our like um, energetic field. I'm an energy healer. I take clients through um, quantum healing sessions while sitting in the field so that they can also, I can be a clearer conduit and send these energies as well by pure quantum entanglement, right? And if people were to not believe this, all this physical proof shows what a gem of a product this is. I can't like recommend this more to anybody like so yes much love and gratitude thank you for listening and uh, i could share so much more but i'd like to wrap this up now thank you lucrezia's final marriage was with a man named alfonso de este the D'Este family was a very, very powerful family in the Italian peninsula. They were huge patrons of the arts. They were patrons of people like Da Vinci and Michelangelo, which is going to play into Cesare Borgia's story. So I thought I had to mention that, meaning they were putting money behind these big artists. The big artists that made Italy beautiful during this time of the Renaissance. Now, the Dieste family had heard of all the rumors of, of Lucrezia, of her perhaps having inappropriate relationships with her family members. They had heard about her poison ring. They had heard about these alleged, this alleged child that she had had. They had heard all the rumors. And so the Dieste family sent spies down to the Vatican to check Lucrezia out before agreeing to marry her to their son, Alfonso. And it's very sweet what the spies came back. The spies came back and they, they told the Dieste family that Lucrezia was nothing but kind and purely innocent. And that she was beautiful and that she was smart. And she wasn't like her family. That perhaps the fact that Borgia blood ran through her veins was more an accident of nature and not who she was as a person. After the spies had vouched for Lucrezia's value, her kindness, Alfonso de Este married her. Now, Alfonso de Este and Lucrezia did not have a romantic relationship they when they did they had eight children but they were not in love with each other is what I, I i meant to say their eight children were born because that was their duty but they respected each other just because alfonso de este was not in love with lucrezia and vice versa there was no violence like her first marriage they were very kind to each other and again they had a lot of children now, Lucrezia, part of her deal to marry into the Dieste family was that she would have to leave her son, Rodrigo, her son she had with her second marriage, behind. She would not be able to take him with her into her new life. Rodrigo was given to Sancha, the aunt, to raise. 
And we do know that this was something that broke Lucrezia's heart even more. We know that throughout Lucrezia's life, she wrote letters and sent gifts to her son, Rodrigo, all the time. She was constantly asking about him, wondering about him, wanting to know how he was doing. Lucrezia would never see her son, Rodrigo, again. Her son would end up getting very sick around the age of 12 and passing away. But again, Lucrezia did have eight other children with her third marriage. Because there was not a lot of romantic love between Lucrezia and Alfonso de Este, they each took on other lovers, openly took on other lovers. I think in this time, the idea of having mistresses, of having lovers in a marriage, you know, it wasn't as scandalous as perhaps we see it today. Because most marriages were political matches, it was very rare to, to find a marriage where other people were not romantically involved with, with the marriage partners. Again, I think that was way more common back then than maybe it is now. And so it just, it is what it is. Uh, we know that Lord Byron read some of Lucrezia's love letters to her lovers and, and spoke about how poetic she was as a writer. It is said that Lord Byron also stole some of Lucrezia's hair. It was like 300 years old at the time, which that's kind of creepy, Lord Byron. I mean, I know you're you're long gone now too, but listen, Lord Byron, if you're listening from the um, quantum astro, don't steal hair, 300-year-old hair, this blonde, thick hair that people had of Lucrezia. I mean, why are you saving Lucrezia's hair? I don't know. But he stole it anyway. So obviously Lucrezia has, has very much, her, her myth, her legend has very much lived longer than her actual person lived. Again, Lucrezia died at the age of 39 years old uh, in childbirth. She lived longer than all of her siblings. By the time that Lucrezia passed away, the Borgia family had very much fallen from grace. Uh, Rodrigo Borgia had passed away on the papal throne. He was no longer the Pope. Her brothers had passed away brutally at the hands of their enemies. But the area in which Lucrezia lived with her final husband, she became known as a very good woman. She was a woman who gave back to the poor. She was a patron to the town. She was known for her kindness, for how much she had to give. And out of all the Borgias, I do say that when Lucrezia passed away, I think that was the, the death that affected people the most. Even though Lucrezia carries with her the scarlet letter of her family's sins because she was the woman, at that time, I do believe that even a lot of Italians knew what a truly spectacular person this girl was. And maybe the Borgia blood that ran through her, her veins was nothing but an accident of nature. And her soul was truly what radiated her beauty. Maybe her true beauty was her kindness Even in a moment where her first husband, who was not nice to her, who made her life a living hell, even when she learned that her brothers were going to remove him, she warned him. She tried to protect him. She loved her second husband with all of her being. She tried so hard to hold on to that relationship for her own happiness. And despite all of the rumors, all of the scandals that people said about her, she still walked around with her head held high and continued in her private life to be of service to others, to help the less fortunate, to be a good mother to the children she was allowed to raise. Lucrezia makes me emotional. And as I said last week, she was the Borgia that really got me interested in this family. And maybe when I was a teenage girl reading about another teenage girl, maybe there was some sort of, of, of empathy and connection 
that goes you know, energy knows no time energy knows no limits and even though lucrezia's birth and my birth are 500 years apart she was born in 1480 i was born in 1983 they are 500 we are 500 years apart from each other maybe as a young girl i felt lucrezia maybe all of us girls have a little bit of that lucrezia borgia in in us in all of us to me, Lucrezia Borgia's story is so inspiring. I think about, on a personal note, all of the rumors that have been made up about me just being on YouTube. All of the lies that men, especially Gordon from Enough is Enough, has made up about me. The way that Gordon from Enough is Enough on Telegram has tried to take ownership of my sexuality on his shows. And I think about all the lies that he specifically has created other people too about me and how I have to get up every day with my head held high and continue to try to be the best version of myself. And I see that in Lucrezia too. And I'm sure for the women watching right now, you've experienced the same thing, maybe not on YouTube or in the public eye, but I'm sure there have been men in your life who tried to dominate you, who tried to own you. Maybe there have been people who've made up rumors about you that weren't true. And you've had to keep going. And so, again, it is my belief that every single woman on this earth, every single little girl born on planet earth has a little bit of that Lucrezia Borgia in them. And that's not a bad thing. Because in my opinion, Lucrezia Borgia was a badass. In my opinion, Lucrezia Borgia was the best thing that ever happened to the Borgia family. And I hope as time goes by, that Scarlet A that she carries on her is removed by all of us women who can relate to Lucrezia Borgia. Now it is stated, it is rumored that the Pope that we have now is a descendant of the Borgias. I don't know if this is true or not. Somebody said he had said he was a descendant of the Borgias. Who knows? I don't even know which Borgia he would have come from. But just because somebody comes from a family doesn't mean they are like that family, again, with the example of Lucrezia Borgia. But we do know the Pope we have now is quite nefarious. So I just think that's interesting, especially if we put our conspiracy hats on for a moment and look at the connection to the Orsinis, the Medecis, all these big families that we know are still allegedly with other names now, <laughs> puppeting our, our, our world as, as we know it. And so, again, that's just something very interesting. But I'm very excited. The next Borgia that we are going to talk about is Cesare, Lucrezia's older brother. And Cesare might be two episodes. We might have to break him up into two episodes because, as I said, I'm saving a lot of the salacious stuff for Cesare. Because out of all the Borgias, Cesare is the bad boy. Like, he is the bad boy. And... I mean, even though he was a total bad boy and there's so much scandal around him, including the Jesus picture, which we'll get to in his relationship with Da Vinci, we'll get into that with Cesare. If there's any historical character that I have a crush on, I hate to admit it, it would be Cesare Borgia, for sure. I mean, he's hot. If you look at his pictures, he was very good looking. All the actors that play Cesare Borgia in these Showtime, in Showtime series and other series are very good looking themselves. He was the epitomal bad boy, Cesare Borgia. But he's also very interesting. There's a lot of psychological stuff we can get into with, with why Cesare does what he does. Did Cesare care? Was he following 
the the footstep of his father. I don't know. We'll get into that when we talk about Cesare Borgia. But that is Lucrezia, you guys. And again, um, as always, if you're if you're looking for someone just to tell you the history without their opinions or without going deeper into conspiracies and discussing the incidents of these people's lives, this is not the channel for you. There are plenty of channels out there that just go through the historical timeline and that's it. Uh, but again, I want to hear, I want to, I want to dissect these things. I want to open these people up and, and see the humanity in them and maybe look at their stories from different perspectives. Maybe all the salacious scandals that are given to the Borgia family was nothing but propaganda. Maybe we can consider that, that maybe, maybe we know the Borgias were putting hits on people, but maybe a lot of these other scandals that you know the, the inappropriate relationships all that kind of stuff maybe that was just propaganda I, I don't know but maybe not i don't know I, I just think it's really important that we talk about this and we look at these people as human beings whether they were good or whether they were bad let's look at the complexity of them and, and maybe we can find some common ground because i think as we move forward into the future and we address these these subjects of these controllers even more and we look at what's happened in our in our earth and to humanity, if we just send them all to Gitmo without actually contemplating what happened and without looking at avenues of healing, then we're no better than them, right? We need to grow and learn and, and learn from each other so we don't make these same mistakes again. And we have empathy for those that maybe we don't like. Maybe you don't like Lucrezia Borgia. Maybe you do think Lucrezia Borgia was a femme fatale who was assassinating people with poison. That's fine. You are totally welcome to your opinion. But what can you learn from her life story? What can you learn from the conditions in which she was born? And how do we course correct so some of this stuff doesn't happen again? All right, you guys. I cannot wait to hear your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below.